This is the day that the Lord has made indeed. Welcome to worship everyone on this fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. My name is Pastor Kelly Wadsworth and I serve as the transitional minister here at Alki UCC, an open and affirming community of faith that is actively seeking paths of peace, justice, hospitality, and inclusion. I want to welcome all who have gathered together from our longtime members to new friends and visitors, we are fully live this morning. So if you wouldn't mind keeping yourselves muted until there is an invitation for an open time of sharing, for time for announcements, and times for questions and answers. It is good to be a faith family on this sunny day with a break from some of the rain, hopefully a break from some of the wind, as we walk together this Christian path as a spiritual community. This work is inherently communal work, and we need one another. Today, we are diving into Mark's stories about Jesus and our own reflections on mission and how we are in the world and the ways that scripture informs that. This is also a communion Sunday, so if you have the opportunity to grab some items that might serve as elements, what you can find in your own home, in your own kitchen, will serve just fine as our bread and our cup together later in the service. And then finally, after worship this morning, please plan on staying on the call so you don't have to go anywhere. It'll be this same link. You don't even have to log out and log back in. After the, pre, after the postlude, the council will provide an important presentation about plans for pastoral leadership in the coming months and what that will look like, and they will be available to answer questions and field any inquiries about that process. And so let us now enter into God's holy story and turn our attention to our call to worship. This is Rod Peeler with our call to worship, which comes from a modern interpretation of Psalm 111. On any given day, God remembers our covenant. It's a beautiful thing, especially when the choir is singing its hallelujah and the stained glass is glinting just right. It's just magnificent when we're standing on the right side of the table, mouths full of promise. God's word of hope and restoration rings out from the pulpit, and we are wrapped or dozing or distracted by the fact that the pulpit is now just another screen, no different from most of our relationships this year. A small square, a slight buzz, a delay in the signal to remind us of how far apart we are from those who used to make up for our shortcomings. This covenant this deep and committed relationship between God and us always seemed like a communal promise full of mercy and compassion and others who could pick up the slack. The word covenant never even meant much more than a rainbow, a spared sun, a disaster that happened to someone else. For years though, we lived in disasters of our own making, struggling to get out ahead of them to make some small difference that might allow us to sleep at night. And then the earth split up more obstacles, spit up more obstacles, and the world shut down. And we had plenty of time to contemplate our relationship to God and with God. And it was not easy or well tended. Not with all those mentions of us instead of me. But God does not forget a promise made just because we've realized how impossible it is to live up to it alone. Without our neighbors, without those who balance us and challenge us and heal us and serve us bread. God remains. God answers us still. God poses new questions and sends up small gifts like the acrid smell of manure before snow. The hazy heart headlights of taxi cabs cutting through fog. 
the surprise of a phone ringing with a friend on the other end. There are signs, if we look, that God remembers. Even through our fear and doubt and isolation, even as we try to shift the blame, even though we fail and fall many times, even when we are on the wrong side of the table and our mouths are empty and dry. Amen. Thank you. This into into um, an epiphany hymn with the same melody, asking Christ to heal us, asking Christ to make us whole. So please join with me now. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Mark 1, 29 through 39. As Jesus' ministry spreads and all manner of people find healing. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left than she was up fixing dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits because the demons knew his true identity. He didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot and prayed. Simon and those with him looked for him. They found him and said, everybody's looking for you. Jesus said, let's go to the rest of the villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. He went to their meeting places all through Galilee, preaching and throwing out the demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Thanks be to God, indeed, for God's living word that continues to reach through the ages and ask us anew, how shall then we live, not only in our own lives, but as a community and as a fellowship? Last week, we did a number of polls in the worship service, and we could call them straw polls, and hopefully they were somewhat fun. Um, and they had to do with questions around Alki's mission in the world and this next chapter into which the church is living. The first poll that we all took together was about of the values in the new mission statement, which one really resonates with the year ahead. They're all beautiful and together they paint quite a lovely picture. But if there was one to just lean into that little extra bit to really dig deep and venture into that space, which one would it be? The results came back that inclusivity, being inclusive was the top winner. And the way that that could be expressed was the second poll. And that poll had a number of different options as to what are some of the ways that al might venture out into the world with this new commission to be a partner and to be a friend to the neighborhood, to the city, to the diverse religious expressions that are happening all throughout our region here in the Pacific Northwest. And so of that second poll, meet and greets rose to the top as one of the primary avenues. So it, that can take a variety of different forms. It can be having formal guests in worship services. It can be having informal times together. Informal times together, we're going to cross our fingers, you know, may return this year. Perhaps in some in-person gatherings, we will hope that the vaccination rollout and the health of our whole country will find some stable footing in the months ahead. So those two pieces, leaning into this quality of being inclusive, I think we could call it a virtue. And virtues, as we know, are not things that necessarily come easily or quickly. They often are hard fought battles, day in and day out, discovering what it is to be an inclusive person, what it is to be an inclusive community. One of the ways I want to just talk a little bit about this morning is the ways that within a church community, there is the internal life, of the fellowship, and then there's the external life, and they speak back and forth to one another. One of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, calls this action and contemplation, and that we need both. They are both sides of the same coin. We need to be active in the world, in mission. We need to be out of our own space, out of our own comfort zone, actively engaged with the world around us. But that is not enough he says, we need the other half of contemplation, which is the side of reflecting on our work in the world and cultivating the interior skills of patience, meditation, prayer, listening. Those qualities then feed back into how we are in the world and what we are like when we show up into a variety of different spaces. And so the back and forth the equal seasoning of one to the other is really an important dynamic to have. And he makes it clear that sometimes us in, in the religious communities have tended to just favor one or the other, just favored being an action mission oriented church or favored being an internal contemplative kind of church. But he really says the, these are so married to each other that we really cannot split them apart. So I want to talk this morning about the internal side, the internal side within our own selves and the internal aspect within the congregation itself. And so internally, when we apply these qualities of being inclusive and inclusivity and having a meet and greet, having a welcome, when we think of that and apply that internally, what do we come up with? 
we come up with perhaps some of our own internal wrestling, our own internal struggles. One of my favorite ways to conceive of this is a term that comes out of the Jungian tradition, but it really has become quite widespread. And it's the concept of the shadow, that we have parts in us that lurk around a little bit more in the shadows. We can find them, we can discover them, but because they are a little more hidden and because they are not as much out in the light, it can take more work. So it can take more work to be inclusive of all of the parts internal within us. In any kind of social environment, in any kind of neighborhood, there tends to be norms of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And can we do that internal work of, can we acknowledge, can we accept that there are times that within our own selves, there are pieces of us that we would call unacceptable, that we don't want to acknowledge because they're not necessarily pretty or socially acceptable or really presentable. Sometimes they are the parts of us that are just much more ragged, much more raw, sometimes embarrassing, sometimes filled with shame. And when we think about that pattern of doing some of that work internally, we see that it's actually a very similar pattern externally. And when we can really cultivate it within our own selves and then cultivate it with one another, and get out of the dance that we sometimes do around shame. And I shouldn't be thinking that, I shouldn't have that piece of me, right? Those are things that live in the shadow. And the more we can become comfortable with those kinds of things, the more equipped we then are to go out into the world and to be Christ's hands and feet. So we are Christ's hands and feet sometimes first to our own selves. And sometimes we are Christ's hands and feet first to our own neighbor in our own congregation. And that's how we get the practice to then be Christ's hands and feet to the world. In the scripture this morning, we are working our way through Mark. And these are the stories of Jesus's ministry. And these are key stories because these are the foundation upon which there is going to be some tension. And that tension we we encounter those parts when we hit Lent, because then we begin to see that these actions and these healings of Jesus really began to upset the apple cart in some significant ways, which then would lead to what we recognize as Jesus's Passion Week, and then his death on Good Friday, and then his ultimate resurrection. So these stories are important, not just because of Jesus's ministry, but because we know that what is coming, these stories are going to be fairly significant in the life of those who were living with him in the first century. So today's story, Jesus is continuing along on his healing mission, and it's growing. Word is getting out. Simon's mother-in-law receives healing from Jesus after having a significant fever. And if we remember, there was not necessarily Tylenol, there was not ibuprofen, you know, to have some quick fever relief. Um, so a fever could be something that was quite dangerous. It could be something that could easily get out of control. So the story today has two important pieces that I want us to look at. We have the ministry of Jesus, which is a healing ministry, and this is an important part of what he is doing, and it is an, an important part of his call in the world. So this healing happens. Jesus is the physician-in-chief in today's story. And word gets out, and not just in a small kind of way, but in the kind of way that folks start coming. They start showing up. We could say they start coming in droves. And whether that's they all came on one day or whether it really meant, you know, there was, there was enough of a presence kind of every single day that this was quickly becoming Jesus's primary focus, which is the second part of the story, which is really kind of a fascinating understanding of Jesus's own thinking. 
he had a very clear sense of what his call in the world was. And it was to spread far and wide the ministry of healing and the kind of healing that restored people back into community. That was one of his primary missions in the world. And he understood that by understanding his particular call, like his leg of the relay, he also understood what was not his call. So his call was not to set up a local hospital. His call was not to set up a church per se. That's going to come in the book of Acts, but Jesus's call was not to be what we would think of as a local church pastor. So as these people start coming for healing and for restoration from their ailments so that they can become once again an integral part of the community and of the neighborhood, Jesus, is hit, Jesus hits a point of tension because it is not his call to stay at Simon's. It is not his call to stay in that town. He is called to a wider kind of ministry. And so he has to take some time and really clarify and articulate that. So in these stories, we have a variety of different modalities of healing. Today's story, it's a pretty Jesus heavy healing. But in last week's story, the healing occur occurred very much in the gentleman who received it. He had to do much of his own internal work. So the modalities of the healing change depending on the circumstances. But what's not changing is Jesus's understanding of his own call and his own mission, which I think can speak to us and can really hone our own understanding of vocation and our own understanding of call. Alki discerned a call to a specific kind of mission, and that is neighborhood-based, multi-faith oriented, to be a strong partner in the neighborhood around, in the city around, to be a strong interfaith partner and to really live into that ecosystem and that dialogue, which has a very long history. And it has some ways that in the 21st century, it's an exciting place to be. It's a very rich dialogue, the, the ways that the religions of the world speak to one another and understand one another. So it's a rich space indeed. And that is Alki's call. And so like the ways that Jesus modeled it, that also means there's going to be a number of things that are not Alki's call and to which the church is called to say no. Not because it's not important, but because it's someone else's work. It will be someone else's work in the first century to travel to the far ends of the earth to spread the good news. It will be someone else's call to set up the early church. It will be someone else's call, the disciples, to really bring the gospel back into their own hometowns and establish the worship in communities. That is not Jesus's call. And so this whole idea of like, yes, what is our leg of the relay and what is not can be very freeing. It can be freeing to understand that we are not always called to be all things to all people all the time. That is God's work. We are called to be a part of the story, but not necessarily the whole story in and of itself. We have just entered into February, which is also Black History Month, and one of the historic Black figures from the 20th century. Really, I like the way that he lived out his call in a beautiful kind of way. And there was one particular piece in his life story that I think is relevant here. Howard Thurman was a scholar, a theologian, a civil rights leader, and a, prolif a prolific writer. One of the things that he did very early on in his ministry is in 1944, so think 1944, the world was being ripped apart at the seams, right? Like we call it World War II. And to live through it 
was a whole nother experience, wondering how was this going to come to an end? What does it mean that not just two parties, but the whole world is at war with itself? So in 1944, Howard Thurman left his, the position he was in to join the Fellowship of Reconciliation and do some significant work there. And the Fellowship of Reconciliation is an international organization rooted in nonviolence. So think about that for a minute. At the height of the entire world being at war with its own self, Howard Thurman stuck his claim on nonviolence because he knew his call. He knew his place and he knew to what he was committed. And in this work then went on to establish and to lead a congregation that was going to be modeled after these very same principles. So as the world is falling apart, Howard Thurman understands I'm going to commit and draw the line in the sand around nonviolence when that's all I see all around us. He also penned a poem that I'm going to read for us this morning that is, it's one of my favorites and I think it's applicable for our time now. And it's called The Work of Christmas. And, and once I read it, you'll see why we're reading a poem called The Work of Christmas in February. So let me close with this. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among brothers and sisters, and to make music in the heart. Alleluia and amen. Alleluia and amen. Let us now together enter into the sacrament of communion, and I invite you to bring what you may have to the screen, and we will share in the bread, and we will share in the cup together. And one of the aspects of the earliest days of communion was that it was a practice that recognized that God's family sometimes is separated, that God's family is not always all together, that there are physical ways we end up separated, geographical ways we end up separated, political ways we end up separated, psychological ways we end up separated. There are so many ways that we end up separated and fractured from one another. And we are living through that now in a very physical kind of way. We are physically separated from one another. But this is not the first time that that has happened. And the sacrament of communion, one of its deepest and most beautiful elements is that it recognizes that God's hope for all of humanity is to be reconciled in all of those different ways, back together in a community, back together in nurturing relationships. And so we partake of Holy Communion today with that hope that one day we will be not just gathered together once again, but able to really live out in the most robust kind of way God's call for our lives and God's call for our community. We have a practice also of putting in the chat box, if you are able, what you are using as your communion elements. And then at the end, we will bless them and pray with pray over them. So don't be shy if you're using something that might be a little off the beaten path. That might just be the thing that happened to be available in your kitchen. So in the chat box, bread and cup, put what you're using and we will bless it at the end. On the night that Jesus died, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all together partake of the bread.
And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is given for you. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us all partake together. During this time of communion offering, I invite you to continue the Lord's Supper in your own homes at your own tables. Please join with me in prayer. Holy One, there is nothing in the far reaches of the earth, in the far reaches of our own pantries, that is too far for you to work through. There is nothing too ordinary that the sacred cannot show up in it. And so we lift up to you and ask for a blessing upon these elements apple juice and goldfish, cinnamon toast and hot chocolate, flatbread and pomegranate juice, water and protein bars, triscuits and white wine, coffee and sourdough, Belvita biscuits and water, pomegranate juice and water crackers, more Belvita cookies and coffee, bread and water, saltines and ginger ale, crackers and milk, apple juice and wisecrackers, plum cake and tea, coffee and walnuts, bread, coffee and water, everything bagel and juice and coffee and crackers. Lord, may your spirit work through all of these elements because we know that is, it is you who come through the most ordinary things in our life and turn them into holy nutrients for our spirits, and for our journey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now turn to our time of offering. Uh, Offering, would please join me in this offering prayer. Gestures of gratitude are a demonstration that a blessing or benefit has been received. We heard a call dropped our nets and came to this place to find new life. The gifts we give today are but tokens of the blessings of the new life we live in Christ. Bring your gifts with joy. For they remind us of just how blessed we are to know this love that flows so generously from the Spirit of God. Amen. Please donate generously through the PayPal link on the website, through a mail donation to the church office, or through text to give by texting the words ALCI UCC, capital A, capital UCC, to 44321, and a donation link will come back to you. Your support for ALCI is part of a living and thriving heritage as the church embraces her third act and is the place where we find our spiritual nurture and home.
Okay, let us turn now to our third and closing hymn. This is Vicki. It's Wanda's chosen hymn, but she didn't want to mess around with getting out of mute, and I don't blame her. So th th it's You Have Come Down to the Lake Shore, and she said this probably really struck her about 15 years ago, I guess, when her grandson was heading down to Stanford, and he went to school down there, then he got his master's, and then he ended up working there, so he was gone for 10 years, but he's back in West Seattle now, in Alki, actually, much to her pleasure, but when he was leaving, she got kind of sentimental and reminiscing about his childhood. And when he was little, he was taking sailing lessons and she would see them when, when he and the kids in the, in the sailing class would go down to the shore with their small boats. And so it's kind of a, a sentimental song for Wanda. You have come down to the lake shore. Thank you, Wanda. Come down to the lake shore, seeking neither the wise nor the wealthy, but only ask me for me to follow. Oh Jesus, you have looked into my eyes, kindly smile. Sisters and brothers, let us be like those disciples who follow Jesus, not because of wealth, not because of prestige, but because of the healing and the restoration that Jesus brings. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.